Welcome to Analyst Talk with Jason Alder. It's like coffee with an analyst, but there's no actual coffee. Each episode, we interviewed an expert in the field of law enforcement analysis to share their career-defining stories and to get their insights on the world. Please join us on recognizing and learning from these brilliant minds as we define the law enforcement analysis profession one episode at a time. Thank you for joining me. I hope many aspects of your life are progressing. My name is Jason Elder, and today our guest has 15 years of law enforcement analysis experience, both with the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office and the Cleveland Police Department. He has extensive work with geoprocessing, cell phone mapping, and long-term solutions. Representing the great state of Ohio, please welcome Todd Wiles. Todd, how are we doing? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. All right. It's good to catch up with you. It's been a while and I am looking forward to this interview. So let's get started here. How did you discover the law enforcement analysis profession? Well, um, I started out like a lot of people in college and was a little bit undecided. I always kind of enjoyed law enforcement and the investigative stuff you saw on TV, like a lot of people. So that kind of drove me to to uh, look into criminal justice majors. But I was also kind of stuck between also wanting to do something computer related, computer science or something along those lines. So I actually uh, ended up majoring in criminal justice and minoring in computer science. At that point in time, I really didn't even know what an analyst was. I just kind of had the idea to go into law enforcement and uh, I thought computers and things like that were going to be a wave of the future. So I just kind of figured I'd eventually figure out how to make that work within a law enforcement job. You know, like a lot of people wanting to be an FBI agent down the line or something like that. And had kind of just in my head come up with this, I don't know, kind of like fantasy that I'd be, you know, at the FBI or a federal law enforcement agency and I'd be utilizing, uh, you know, digital forensics or something like that. So I did this curriculum in computer science and I really enjoyed that and I enjoyed law enforcement. So I I liked my major. And from there, I had a professor in undergrad. He encouraged me to go on to get my master's degree. He hired me on as a graduate assistant and he was working at an institute that did a lot of data research in the area of criminal justice. That's Dr. Eric Jeffress um, at Kent State University. He had started his career, uh, he had a PhD from Cincinnati and started his career at the National Institute of Justice in their mapping program and had done quite a bit of mapping and, you know, was kind of on the floor, um, ground floor of a lot of that pioneering, utilizing maps and GIS in law enforcement. So in the master's program, he kind of substituted GIS within our criminal justice methods class and methods to like criminal justice statistical methods. He integrated some GIS and spatial routines into that. Um, And I was also assisting him in writing papers um, as a graduate assistant too, doing literature research. And so anyway, all that kind of led me um, to discover a lot of like the early, early research that was in the vein of crime analysis, like environmental criminology, Paul and Patricia Brantingham and some of those early researchers, criminal justice researchers that were doing stuff that was kind of the the groundwork for some of the modern analysis. And I ended up doing my master's thesis and defending it on with a GIS project about just fugitives and some things with GIS with that. I find it interesting that the Kent State Institute is called the Institute for Prevention of Violence which is pretty specific. I I would think that most of them would be uh, tailored around criminal justice or just uh, justice in general. And this is very specific. It's prevention of violence. How does that make it different from other institutes? I want to say a lot of their projects were based out of stuff going on in the Cleveland area. And I think that they put a lot of focus on whether it be uh, children who witness violence or gun violence in in the community with juveniles. Just a lot of the projects that they set out to work on kind of fell along those lines uh, for the criminal justice world. So Okay. So then you graduate and then you get your first 
gig at Jacksonville Sheriff's Office. How'd you end up in Jacksonville? That was in 2005, I believe. So when I was a graduate assistant, Eric Jeffress talked to me about what an analyst was. And I decided, yeah, that sounds exactly what I'm looking for. Sounds like, like I'll be able to use my data skills and also get to, to take part in law enforcement investigations and things along those lines. So I had made the decision that I wanted to be an analyst and he pointed me to, he was on the LE analyst listserv, I think at that point. And he was also on the IACA listserv at that point in time. So he pointed me to the uh, listserv um, and told me that there were jobs posted there uh, from time to time. So when uh, ever he saw a job come up, he would go ahead and forward it to me. And I was working in the same office with him too, but I went ahead and applied for a couple jobs that I saw coming up. I actually interviewed in Alexandria, Virginia. And I think um, Joe Ryan was uh, interviewing for that job too and got chosen over me um <laughs> and i was close in the running on that um i think mary garen interviewed me and uh yeah. picked joe but you know yeah. we, i saw that it was kind of a small community there of people that knew each other and eric had put in a word with matt matt white was really big in the field at that point in time too and so that small group of people kind of I think talked a little bit about, you know, me possibly being a good fit down there. So the job came up in Jacksonville. Matt had been there, I want to say two years before I went there. Matt White was a crime analysis manager at the time. And he would he was a supervisor and analyst at Charlotte Mecklenburg before. Um, and it had done some won awards in problem oriented policing before that and been an active member of IACA. So anyway, um, the job came out and Quite a few people applied and I hopped on a plane, flew down there and interviewed, had me back for a couple of interviews and got the job. Excellent. Excellent. I think it's funny that you mentioned Joey Ryan because he eventually made his way down to Jacksonville as well. So he that's did. that's funny. After you left, he was down there at Jacksonville Sheriff's Office. So when you get down to Jacksonville, how was the transition from what you were doing there with the Institute to now being an analyst down there at the Sheriff's office. Well, I had all the background in GIS at that time and I knew databases and access well, and I had the background in computer science, but most of the research projects there, the, the intent and goal of the research projects might've been similar to some of the problem oriented policing or the longer term strategic projects that we worked on at the Sheriff's office, but everything was, way faster paced. So like immediately I noticed that, you know, and, and research work, you know, something that we would have a timeline of, you know, a couple weeks on that speed really mattered in the police department. So the quicker you get the information out, analyze it and get it to officers, you know, they might be expecting an, even an hour turnaround for, for products, you know, based on a criminal investigation or something like that. So um, immediately the biggest difference that I saw was speed. What um, I, I consider Matt, um, Matt White, just at that time, I was blown away by how well he had planned everything out data-wise and just kind of introduced me to concepts that I just, I would have never thought of um, without seeing him do those things or, or put these plans in place. And much of his focus was for the whole organization and for the whole crime analysis unit was this very meticulous plan of data organization, data processing, and having data that was timely, clean, and ready to analyze at your fingertips and basically real time. Now, this is back in 2005, 2006. Yes. You know, at that point in time, just getting people even to know what data was outside of, you know, this arena, why well, I, I thought was a difficult task, you know. Um, so I stepped in with Matt in Jacksonville and immediately I found out like, well, not only does he have everybody understanding what data is and how to leverage it, he's making it real time um, at people's fingertips and allowing these analysts to have clean data to be able to give answers and put together products um, really quickly and actually do analytics. The records management system, is it in-house or do, are you going through a vendor? Do you have one of the vendor products at this time? So Jacksonville is a unique jurisdiction and that um, they consolidated city, county. I want to say like in the 80s or somewhere around there. It might have been the 70s. I don't know. 
but their whole county really was under one law enforcement umbrella. So that allowed them to unify all their data systems. You didn't have a lot of disparate data systems um, and that, you know, maybe you'd have in, in, in a lot of cities, maybe you have a city system, then a county system, you have neighboring cities that um, have their own systems. So really, you just had one big system. And the jail was also in the jail and all the correction stuff and the court processing was all under the city of Jacksonville, the county of Duval as well. So they they had these big data repositories within their RMS system or the jail booking system um, that you really didn't need to house and warehouse data like you do now from a lot of different sources because you only really had one source. So anyway, the records management system was a homegrown system okay. and they had a pretty robust IT staff that was really competent, knew what they're doing and, and had written some, you know, really good uh, software for the records management system. And they did upgrades and things like that through the years. But basically all the county arrest data, all the county calls for service data, all the county EMS data and all the policing um, case incidents and field investigations were in the uh, one records management system. Nice. So when you're st- just starting out there, what kinds of tasks are you doing? So I'm trying to think of where I was assigned first. I think I was assigned each analyst. There were quite a few analysts in Jacksonville. Matt had, I want to say there were probably eight people doing analysis when I first started. Matt being the manager and a couple other people, but he broke down the analyst responsibilities. We had I think there were six districts or there were six zones, areas of the city. So you could be a patrol analyst that would be assigned to one of the city zones, districts, subdivisions of the city, and you would support patrol, um, just anything and everything they were going to with calls for service or break-ins or anything, loud noise, whatever it would be. But then all the investigative units, he would assign analysts as well. So. I think I started out being um, the analyst for the uh, aggravated battery unit, which was felonious assault shootings, got anything involving a gun, people shooting at each other. And then also the gang unit within the uh, Jacksonville Police Department. So I started out analyzing data for both those two units. Okay. So... I guess my, I'm smiling because I'm like, well, since the data is so good, you should have been able to do so much great analysis. So let's talk about some of this great analysis you were able to do with all this clean data. Yeah, sure. Um, I think that I think that I did some really good analysis. I think that a lot of people in the unit, I was really fortunate to work with a lot of talented people. Matt was very focused on bringing in really bright people that all had unique personalities that they were really driven to do the job. So um, we had quite a few young, young, eager people at the time. And I think a lot of people did some really good work, but with uh, a records management system, everything is pre geocoded every day, you know, from yesterday's, all yesterday's incidents. So immediately when you came in, you know, you just downloaded yesterday's data. And again, you know, some of this stuff doesn't sound that cutting edge, but you have to think back to 2006, 2007, that time period. It was, it was pretty amazing, I think, to have it that way. I but agree. you would open up your map and um, like aggravated battery, which is what I was working on initially. Um, the first thing that you, you'd, of course, read and review all the cases. You'd look at them on the map, look for clusters of things taking place, look for any connections that you could. We'd also sit with the investigative units, work hand in hand with the detectives. They need to research on anything. Aggravated battery, one thing that I worked to set up um, initially was something to look at each case and um, immediately we made an automated system that would immediately look at the victim of the crime and see if that victim had been involved in any other violent incidents recently. Um, So it was kind of a tipping off point when we looked at those aggravated battery victims to see, well, is this a retaliatory shooting? Do we have somebody who's just constantly in the wrong place at the wrong time that might tip us off, you know, that of who you might might want to talk to in relation to the shooting or what this this events, you know, might be about on a bigger level. So that was kind of something that we started there and um, started looking at that on a daily basis for every shooting. We had a database that would track you know, nicknames, we could do link analysis with family members and associates and things like that. So we did a lot. We did link charting and we had I2 
got to give Matt a lot of credit as well. He was always pushing to get the newest software. We had a TAC. We went to a lot of training. I went to all that and CA conferences when I worked there. So anyway, that was kind of a summary of a lot of the stuff that we were working on on a daily basis. And then, so then you're there about five years and then you make the trip back home, at least closer to home. So you go to Cleveland PD. So why did you make the journey back home? Well, you know, just kind of life circumstances. I had always wanted to get back at some point in time. Um, I pretty much moved to Jacksonville without really knowing a single person there. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, and I was 24, 25 years old when I took the job, 24, I think. That didn't bother me when I was taking the job, but it just wasn't exactly where I wanted to, you know, spend the rest of my life. But I thought going to Florida at a young age was a real good uh, idea to have some fun and experience a different part of the country. So Cleveland, Eric Jeffers, I had still stayed in contact with him. He, he was my mentor in my master's program. And he told me that there was this new position open in the Cleveland area. And this is uh, roughly 2008 um, when the hiring process was taking place in Cleveland. And Cleveland had zero analysts at that time, none, no civilian analysts, very few civilians at all, actually, in the department, but they were going to hire their first civilian analyst. So that was this position, and they had been working with, Cleveland police had been working with some of the, um, I think the Northern Ohio violent, the NOVCC had kind of gotten convinced that analysis was would benefit them. Um, and that they need to bring in some, a civilian team. So anyway, that was kind of the fruition and the start of, of that process in the Cleveland area. So the job came open. I thought it was perfect um, that I could that I could get back there. And um, I was also, you know, at the point in my life looking to get closer to family and maybe start a family of my own. You know, I wanted to head back to the area where I was familiar, had some roots. So it all worked out perfect. And then, so how does the data in Cleveland compare with the data that you left in Jacksonville Sheriff's Office? (laughs) Well, so I would say as a subset, percentage-wise of of the data available um, in the systems, Cleveland probably had maybe 30% of the systems kind of um, available and clean data um, and usable data. So it was definitely smaller data set, less systems available. In Jacksonville, we had also, in addition to our law enforcement data, uh, we had a lot of data like corrections data, jail data, all the booking photos. We had reports. You could just select arrests in an area and pop off a list of like, you know, if you wanted all burglaries in the neighborhood and you wanted all burglary arrests in the last two years, you just select those burglaries in the neighborhood, fit it out to a report and a report will come up with a picture of all those arrestees um, and all the burglary offenses. You know, if you had a burglary down the line and you just wanted to give the victims or witnesses in the area, somebody to look at, something like that. So that was, none of that was possible at Cleveland when I first started. They were still using, believe it or not, in 2009, an AS400, um, an IBM AS400 <laughs> server. They had New World as, as a software vendor for their records management system, but they were still on a version that used that AS400. <laughs> so right out of the gate, that made it pretty limited that you were doing, you had to do ODBC connections to access databases to do any data processing because there was just no SQL side to it. And I think the AS400 used a programming language RPG and they still had one really old RPG programmer when I started. (laughs) And so that person could kind of organize this AS400 data and some views for me to connect to and link to an access database and do some data cleaning and, you know, synthesizing on that information. But it was definitely a lot more steps slower to get the data processed and not as much data for sure. Okay. So how did you go from there into something that's a little bit more workable today? Well, I've always been big into crystal reports. And so that makes one of us. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I know there's uh, Chris, good old Crystal Reports, you know, I mean, they packaged it with ARC back in the day, 
And it was just such a go-to for so many years that even though, you know, it doesn't have the capabilities of some of the modern reporting software, I'll still always whip it out, you know, every now and then for a product. You know, I, I, I just think it's quick and nimble for desktop software to make quick products, charts, graphs, lists, things like that. So anyway, the first step was to the Chief McGrath, who was the police chief at the time, and he had been chief for uh, about three or four years when I started, he was making a big push into intelligence-led policing. It was, you know, when I come from Jacksonville, I took this position and it was a project coordinator position of the crime analysis unit. So initially, um, Chief McGrath came down to see me pretty much the first week I was there and talked to me about the expectations he had. And one of his first requests or, or priorities that he wanted the crime analysis unit to be working on was a full out comp stat um, uh, program and he wanted to start there. So my first step was developing comp stat type reports with some analytics and trend work and in some thresholds and things like that to say, you know, at that point in time, they really didn't have anything to tell them. They couldn't answer simple questions like in the last 30 days, are we seeing more robberies than we did in the 30 days before? Just something, something like that. Um, People people would know off the top of their head, but they didn't have a report that could pinpoint that information. So that was step one, build all that stuff in Crystal reports. Crystal hooks into access well. Um, I do a lot of access work anyway, know some VB and macros and making modules and things like that to clean the data and access. Wasn't that, it really wasn't that bad, but basically we took, I took the RMS system exported it to access wrote a lot of cleaning and, and things like that within access interesting so then because you also did comstat in jacksonville as well correct we did and so and so this is developing in cleveland just maybe compare and contrast the two styles of how comstat was used and implemented between the two departments the difference was let me try to remember all the uh, ins and outs. Matt was always Matt was always pushing to be on the cutting edge of every of how we did everything. In Jacksonville, um, we had multiple analysts assigned to CompStat to prepare summaries of all crime types that took place before the meeting. That information was kind of summarized in in products or documents and disseminated to the bureau heads, the lieutenants the commanders of those areas, whether it be patrol or the homicide unit or violent crimes, sex crimes, et cetera. So a lot of work was being done by each individual person. So there was just no way to duplicate that amount of work right off the gate. There wasn't, there wasn't any way mm -hmm. to get that in depth that we did down there on every single incident that took place in the city, which is pretty much what was taking place in Jacksonville when I left. At their comp stat, they had a big screen and a projector. Everybody sat around the table. They pulled up each, each. they called them zones, I think. We call them districts in Cleveland, but they pull up every zone of the city and we'd run live GIS in our comp stat meetings. And now this is, again, this is in 2007. And you have to remember how slow GIS was at that point in time. You couldn't do it. We, so Matt, Matt went out and, and constantly pressured them to get the best computer possible to run this live GIS at, at um, comp stat meeting. And so we'd actually go through each individual incident. So we'd go to uh, zone of the city and say, let's see, let's see the sex crimes that took place in the last two weeks. We'd put them up on the map. There'd be 30 people in the room. The sheriff would be at the head of the table. We'd go through every incident and we'd go, he'd go, you know, let me see those three incidents that took place in the south part of the zone. You know, <laughs> and he'd say, well, what's, you know, what's happening over there on Lem Turner Road or something like that. We also had it hooked up so you could click on an incident with the identify tool in ArcGIS. It would bring up that contents table like it does. And there was a URL within that contents table. When you click on it, you click on the URL and it would bring up the narrative of the incident. We'd all sit there, 30 people in CompStat and read the narrative summary of every single incident that the sheriff wanted to see. So it was a pretty in-depth process. Could last, you know, two, three hours sometimes, or that's at least my memory of it. Long time, it seemed like, it seemed like forever some days. So those were big shoes to fill. It was a high task to live up to to build something that was even close to what Matt had built. 
in Jacksonville. So in, in, in trying to duplicate, I pretty much started out with a lot of the analytic methods that we had used in Jacksonville to identify patterns, series, and trends. And a lot of that was either spatial-based or temporal-based, where I, at that, again, at that point, there weren't many people in the unit. It was in Cleveland. It was myself, a detective, a sergeant, and another records clerk that had got put in the unit. So we kind of had four people and um, we just didn't have a lot of resources and manpower. The detective was working on a lot of human intelligence, link charts, running down things for specific investigations. So I was pretty much doing all the crime analysis and it was just me. <laughs> so That's so. amazing when I think about it. For those that don't know Cleveland very well, Cleveland's a pretty big city. I mean, we're not talking about some small town. For, for You only have one or two analysts around the time of 2010. That was a pretty big area to be responsible for. Yeah, it's a big area and it's high volume crime too um, for the area. There are 40,000 part one crimes in Cleveland every year. We have roughly probably on average 120 murders. So you're dealing with a lot of serious incidents. We handle about 80,000 general criminal incidents in our records management system every year. So 80,000 crimes, 80, 80 to 90,000 reports being made, like I said, some years, 40,000 of those being part one crimes. So yeah, the, the volume's huge. Uh, 400,000 calls for service. Population is about 380,000, but it's one of those East Coast cities that's kind of sandwiched in between a variety of suburbs, uh, outer ring suburbs and inner ring su suburbs. So the whole Cleveland area is more like 2 million people. City of Cleveland's only close to 400,000. Yeah. Um, and that's where a lot of the crime takes place in the area, in, in the greater Northeast Ohio area. So, um, yeah, there's no shortage of, of crime to analyze. All right. Well, let's take a break. When we come back, I want to talk about your analyst badge story. You're listening to Analyst Talk with Jason Outer. We'll be right back. Erin Wickersham from the Maricopa County Attorney's Office, and my public service announcement is to go on a court along. Uh, you may have been on a ride along, and I think someone else recommended a 911 operator sit along. So find a prosecutor in your jurisdiction and see if you can go to court with them. You'll learn a lot about the process and about the work that they're doing. What's going on, analysts? My name is Manny San Pedro. I'm the technology director for the IACA. And here is my public service announcement for analysts. Don't become overly reliant on Excel. Use it to analyze and break down your data. It's a fantastic tool. Fantastic. And it's free as part of the Microsoft Office offering. But don't use it as a database. Use a database as a database. Connect to the database with Excel. And then use it for your pivoting for all your slicing and dicing, even developing your dashboard. But again, don't use Excel for everything because it may not be the best tool for you. All right, well, let's get to your analyst badge story. This is uh, sponsored by Mindy's quick tips. So Mindy Hewn, who's the co-creator of this podcast, she publishes the second Thursday of every month, an animated series to help analysts with a particular issue. So check out Mindy's quick tips, the second Thursday of every month. All right, Todd, then what would you say is your career defining case or project that you worked on your analyst badge story? Well, I started doing quite a bit of cell phone analysis for the department. My motto through the years has just been, I have to go for the most bang for your buck most of the time is when I'm working, when I'm, when I'm kind of devoting my time to different analysis, whether it's, you know, Comstat or if I'm helping out investigators, most of the time I, I ended up when I, when I would get time to devote to tactical crime analysis, it was for the homicide unit and it was cell phone tracking, cell phone analysis, when they subpoena or get warrants for cell phones. I enjoy GIS and, you know, I have a map in front of me all the time. I'm always trying to learn new things and push the limits with 
model builder and just anything I can do to make the product a little better in GIS. But one of the uh, one of the things that I kind of ended up gravitating towards to do a lot of was cell phone mapping when they'd subpoena cell phone information regarding the incoming and outgoing calls and the towers that were used. So I've been doing that for the department for a while. I'd also been making bulletins too. I've made a lot of bulletins. We had an internet site that we use. Now we use SharePoint, but I posted a lot of crime bulletins throughout the years for different departments and units. And I think it was 2014, we had a work with the sex crimes unit occasionally as well. And they had a rape case where a jogger in the early morning had been assaulted and raped and the uh, lieutenant of the unit had been in contact with one of the suburbs and apparently um, the next suburb over, um, one, one suburb over in Cleveland is Lakewood, Ohio. And three days prior, um, a woman had been raped in the early morning hours as well. So the, uh, the lieutenant got the case on that day um, that it happened and immediately kind of sent something out to people doing sex crimes investigations in the area and immediately found out three days earlier, Lakewood had had a case where somebody was raped and um, the stories matched up pretty closely. And from that point, the Lieutenant was pretty sure um, this was James McPike in our Cleveland police sex crimes unit at that time was pretty sure that these two incidents were related. So after that, he called me on the phone and asked me to come down and look at what they had. And initially, he wanted me to make a bulletin and put it out to the local area. So he's local area departments because he knew this had happened in Lakewood. And then we had one in Cleveland three days later. There's a good chance that, you know, could have happened somewhere else in the near vicinity outside of our jurisdiction and not known about it. So we wanted to get it out as quickly as possible to people in the area about what had taken place. And so he called me down to work on a bulletin for him. And as it turned out, um, they had some really good surveillance videos. The individual that committed the rape had been in the area. This It took place, I think, at 5.30 in the morning, something like that. But the um, offender had been kind of casing the area around 5 o'clock. So he had kind of been pacing through the neighborhood a little bit. And this is a neighborhood with quite a few apartment complexes. And so they had some good surveillance footage. Um, it was a little bit grainy and it was dark, but um, they, as far as matching up timelines, um, it was great to tell um, when the individual was at different locations. Mm -hmm. So anyway, he wanted me to take the uh, stills from the video, some of the surveillance video and put together a bulletin for the area dissemination channels. I started looking at the video and he gave me the full video. He, he told me, go ahead and pull some stills out and clean them up if you can, or you know, just get the ones that you think, get the get some stills out of there that you think are the best shots of the guy. There weren't any great shots of his face or anything, just kind of outlines because it was dark. But anyway, there were two sets of videos uh, that the time period around five o'clock in the morning when he was casing around the neighborhood uh, and then then right after there was actually a video of him chasing after this jogger um, in one of the videos you see the jogger go past and then he runs after her. then you could um, kind of splice that together with another set of videos that we got from when they got to another place and this is just before the attack you actually see him come up behind her and hit her that is the start of the attack and then it goes off the video screen after that so anyway, we had, a, you know, the, the sex crimes unit had a really good timeline on exactly when everything happened from that. I was looking at the videos and I was pulling out stills and I saw in the, in the stills that I pulled out, well, he, in, in the time period that he was casing, I was looking at some of the other videos. I saw him on the phone and he was smoking a cigarette and on the phone. I thought, well, if he was, if he's on the phone, like at that pinpoint time, you know, and there was another crime in Lakewood three days earlier, I thought, well, we should, let's try to do a tower dump. So I went back down and talked to the lieutenant of the unit. And I said, I really think that we might be able to, you know, get a common number off these two towers. He's, he's definitely on the phone. There's no doubt about it in this video. And I can tell exactly when he's on the phone. And so I said, if, if we can get the time period in Lakewood when this took place and match up any calls going through that tower with any calls going through the tower that uh, would be the closest on the Cleveland incident, you know, we can get the common number and work backwards from there. You know, commonly 
call it a tower dump. This is in 2014. I think people are a little bit more familiar with the tactic now and the technique. At that time period, I don't think we had really ever done one in Cleveland, or if we had, or including detectives, maybe they had worked with the FBI or done one prior to that that I hadn't heard about, but it wasn't a real well-known or widely used technique. So I had to kind of explain to the lieutenant and the detective what this would consist of, and they had never heard of it, I don't think, at that point in time, the technique. And... Neither had uh, the people in the subpoena and warrant preparation unit within the prosecutor's department, prosecutor's office. So I had, I went with the detective to the prosecutor's office and, you know, we sat there and detailed the incident and we suggested how to write up this warrant to be served to these uh, different telephone companies, the cellular carriers. You know, there's really only four major ones that run the network. And so if we send this to Verizon, T-Mobile, Sprint, you know, when we get this back where you can correlate all the numbers going through the towers, those two particular times on those two different dates and get a common number. That was, um, that was all like that same day this took place that took place at five o'clock in the morning. I think that was all, all that same day. So it was a long day, stayed at the prosecutor's office for a long time, trying to explain how to, you know, what to ask for with these uh, records, because it's difficult at that point, there wasn't really a template and for, for, for requesting the information and, you know, I pulled up some old cases and actually got the act, the the tower names and to identify where the towers were at and what ones, be specific about what towers we were asking for and the communication that we were asking that went through those towers, um, cell phone towers. So anyway, uh, the subpoena gets submitted and uh, the, the warrant gets submitted. They take it to the judge. He signs off on it. They send it to the cell phone carriers and the returns start coming back from the carrier. So I'm getting this data back of all the incoming outgoing calls and Verizon Sprint and I think AT&T came back. One of them took a while. But anyway, they started coming back and, you know, it's just very different from data set to data set. So it was a lot of, a lot of uh, piecing together what I was looking at. But so I start running the, just all kinds of joins, originating caller to, um, you know, originating caller to uh, terminating caller from... What are, what are you using? I'm using Microsoft Access and SQL. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All so, right. yeah, ac Access is kind of... I can do I can do most things in Access, you know, if, if uh, I have enough time. But uh, a lot of the data, you know, kind of had to be unified and creating your own fields and coding it and different things like that. But, you know, it's just essentially a lot of joins once you get... A common field where you uh, get the numbers lined up in, in your like outgoing field from carrier to carrier. You have all the carriers together and you have, you know, you find your outgoing column, outgoing numbers that were routed through that tower. And then you're joining that up with people making outgoing calls during the t that time period of the other rape on the towers that were nearest, you know, that rape case three days earlier. So are you just getting pings or are you just getting the calls? We only were getting calls going through. Okay. We were not getting round trip delay estimations or anything like that of people okay. in the area. And that was because we, we just asked for people making calls or, or text message or data submissions. But the communication, we just asked for people going through that tower because, you know, in 2014, a little bit different. I had probably asked for round trip delay and, you know, estimated location from people at this point in time but uh we knew he was on the phone so we knew for sure he was going through a tower his communication was going through a tower on the cleveland rape incident so anyway move forward and just joining all that data up and pulling out common numbers and and they and also took took the numbers during the specific time period the other thing that we knew in the specific time period, we knew for sure that he was on the telephone. He was on a cell phone making a call. Just numbers routed through that tower as the originating caller would give us a list of potential suspects. Like how many initially was on that list? Do you remember? <laughs> well, yeah, it depends what time period you're talking about. The The fortunate thing was having, having the, the photos of him on the phone. Um, and having the video of him on the phone with the timestamp. So, you know, it really kind of boiled down to about um, seven or eight people 
Nice. Now, now this was now you have to also this was per carrier though as well, mm -hmm. and you don't know specifically which tower, so you're just you know if, if it's a different if he's using Verizon, it would have been you know Tower A. If he's using Sprint, it's you know a tower over here. Um, you know if it's AT and T, maybe it's either one of these towers. Uh, you know that are that are kind of equal distance from the the um, area. So anyway, per carrier it was probably seven or eight. So you know that it equaled about like 28 30 30 people it was like i think it was a tuesday it was a it was a weekday and it was early morning so you know not a high traffic time for people to be just up talking on the phone on that uh particular street or that area mm -hmm. so uh, we so i took those numbers in that short of the long on the tower dump and correlating the two towers there really weren't any numbers that made any sense or matched up between the two towers nobody had been using there weren't there weren't common numbers using the phone and that separate location at the same time as somebody using a phone at Cleveland. anyway so that that method didn't work out to find a common number but but we did know that he was definitely using the phone so took the you know, 30 or so people started batching it, sort of batching that list of 30 important items and, and numbers of interest and started batching that list of numbers through all of our databases, started batching the list through, you know, clear and accurate and things like that. But also uh, any of our local databases where we retain call data for from other systems, uh, those cell phone numbers came up in some records when they were batched through our local, some of our local databases from that so so from that I developed some names from these numbers and so each individual person started doing some um, looking into them um, pulling up arrest booking photos and things like that and you know out of this out of the set of people there was there was one person that stuck out quite a bit also in the the video and um, statements from the victim was that this individual had been, he had, had had a Cleveland Indians baseball cap on. So I started doing some social media research on the person who jumped out and, you know, sure enough, lots of Cleveland Indian baseball caps <laughs> and a lot of the social media photos. And so, you know, you have this list of numbers going through the tower and then you get a photo that fits and um, look at, look at social media and start seeing some, some of the clothing that could be kind of similar. Took that to the detectives. Um, they had a meeting with the prosecutor's office and they started keying in a little bit on this guy. You know, I thought it was a pretty good match. Everybody else did. And it, things were looking really good. The FBI was involved, you know, it's a pretty big case. And at the same time, they had done touch DNA as well. The offender had been careful not to leave any, um, any evidence, um, mm -hmm. DNA evidence um, in the traditional form of rape, you know. You know what I'm saying, but yes, um, I do. <laughs> <laughs> so, but he had had um, he had gone through the victim's pockets, and so they got touch DNA inside of the pocket of the victim. So that was being processed at the same time of this. The detectives had keyed in on this person that I found through the cell phone data. About a day later, that the touch DNA hit came back with a positive identification, and that was linked to an individual named James Daniels. It didn't match the guy that I had found, but it was almost such a good match. People were just like, how, you know, how is this possible that it didn't match? Well, turned out they were brothers and he was on the phone. The, the one, the touch DNA was on the actual offender, James Daniels. And I had identified his brother who he was on the phone with at that time. And they were, <sighs> before the rape took place they were actually casing um the area for they were breaking into cars too it was something they commonly did in the area and they were talking on the phone about breaking into cars on that call that identified him so it was the two brothers on the phone and they looked very 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 similar so with that they were really happy because they had already looked the detectives and you know everybody involved were really happy because they had already done a lot of research on this brother and had you know houses and cell phone numbers and documents in place and they were also to get able to get the brother to give them information because you know they had him as an accomplice on the phone so mm -hmm. you know they got some real helpful information in, in arresting and, and charging the uh guy who committed the rapes 
Wow. Well, good for you. And way to bring in a, a different solution, a unique solution, a solution that's never been used before into this scenario. As you said, you spent most of the day at the prosecutor's office that day explaining how this could be done. So kudos for you to get this done and coming all together and getting these two guys. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. All right. Let's take a break. When we come back, I want to talk a little bit about data and your advice about data. We'll talk about your personal interests and we'll play Don't Be That Analyst. Sounds good. You listen to Analyst Talk with Jason Elder. We'll be right back. Hi, this is Don Clausius. I just want you to know that when you hear or you think as an analyst, they don't know what they want us to do. Always remember, you don't have to wait. Show them, tell them, and be value added. Hey, this is uh, Steve Belts. And I've got a pet peeve I want to share with you folks. You know, we all have the uh, cell phone driving issue, but I kind of take it down more to the local level here. It's not dangerous, but extremely annoying. I'm having to make my way through airports now again, and and you get that person in front of you that's either reading something off of their cell phone or talking to somebody on their cell phone, and, and you're trying to get to your gate, and you don't realize that people are backing up behind them, just like as if they were driving a car, uh, get off your cell phones and or pull over to the curb with your cell phone in the, in the airport and uh, get it out of the way. So appreciate it. Thanks. Welcome back. Todd, I'd like to get your advice on technology now. He's, we spent the first half of this interview talking about your experience and how you've worked with data, essentially to make data work for you. And so I want to just ask you your advice to the audience when it comes to making data work for them. Well, I think it's start out, I'd encourage people to become as intimately aware of how your data is collected um, from start to finish and how it's stored after it's collected from that. I would encourage people to really study it and maybe take a look at some of the, the, the newer techniques that people are using in data warehousing and data science fields about making data kind of interoperable between systems, finding a way to connect their data, disparate data sets that wouldn't maybe traditionally go together and bringing in as many data sources as you can from the area, whether it be even in law enforcement or in your warehouse, bringing in stuff from, from public health, from, you know, building and housing or corrections, any other field that you feel can add value in your analysis to, uh, as those things correlate to crime. I think a lot of our crime problems are driven by things that take place in society that are captured in, in a lot of other data sets. That's one thing that I really took from Jacksonville is, is just how additional data sets that might not be traditionally thought of as law enforcement data sets can really add value to analysis and figuring out a way to, to connect those things, whether they be spatial, you know, spatial links to each other, how they correlate with each other spatially, or, um, you know, how they correlate to each other by address or, or by people, just kind of cleaning the data. Um, so you have some key joining fields that make the data interoperable. I think I think it's interesting. I would add to that different departments within the city have useful data. I always think about when my time in Cincinnati when I got access to the Park Services database because there was reports written on graffiti, there were sometimes license plates in there, there were sometimes people that were interviewed information was in there. There was a lot of good information in there that I was able to get access to. And it was just another data set at my disposal. So look into different departments within the city that you work to obtain data as well. Yeah, I think that's a great idea for sure. So one of the things is, is establishing if you don't have a system in play that's analyst friendly, you know, think about when you went from Jacksonville to Cleveland, 
what would, you, would your advice be if somebody's in that situation, like just maybe initial first steps or some lessons learned that you want to pass along to them? What would your advice be to them? I guess I would always start out with data. Um, and we keep hitting that point, but um, I feel like data is the foundation of all of our analysis. So um, initially I do some sort of a, a synopsis. I'd, I'd initially come into the department and do some sort of a synopsis through either formal or informal interviews of people working in, in the department in area units and bureaus and things like that. What data do you collect? Where is it at? You know, how useful is it to you? Looking at how that information is stored. Um, if you're coming in and you're kind of tasked with doing a lot of this stuff on your own, um, I would suggest learn SQL. You know, there's there's tons of free and or reasonably priced training programs out there um, where you can learn to code and you can learn SQL. Learn how to learn how to extract and load and learn about ETL packages to extract and load that data from different data sets to make it all come into a system that you can join together. Some of the data warehousing principles that are taught again, you know, a lot of it it can be daunting when you first start out, but um, after you get going on it, if you've been doing data analysis for a long time, a lot of the ideas kind of click and it's all just data regardless of what, you know, department it comes from. Good, good, good. And then do you have any current projects that you're working there on in Cleveland in terms of improving your overall data management? Uh, we're, we're always working on it. We have a data warehouse and we're always working on our data warehousing project uh, to bring in as much data as possible. We have a new uh, compliance team, data compliance team, where we're, we're seeking to um, collect more data as it relates to community engagement and field stops, problem-oriented policing. One of the initiatives that's come out recently is that within the department is that a lot of officers are going to kind of be mandated to spend a certain amount of their time on with CPOP projects and community-oriented projects. Right now, we have a team that's kind of working on figuring out how to collect information and get a good idea of what's being done along that community-oriented policing avenue. So, so that's always taking place, and that data will be brought into the warehouse. You know, we'll figure out how to join that together and put together projects to see how, you know, if we're having a crime impact or not. Okay, good. All right, well, let's move on a little bit. We could certainly spend uh, a lot of time on that topic. I find uh, data, big data, business intelligence, data management, I, I do find that topic fascinating. But I do want to move on to your personal interests. And okay. you are into Bitcoin, which is a fascinating topic. So how did you get started with Bitcoin? Well, like a lot of people, yeah, cryptocurrency became kind of interesting. You know, being a data head, it just kind of clicked with me. It, it, when I first heard about it, I was kind of fascinated. And like lots of people, you know, I just, I heard about it, and you know, back in, I don't know, 2012 or 2013 or something like that uh, time period then. And I just, I just thought it was a fad that would come and go and didn't really uh, pay much attention to it. Um, just kind of looked into underlying um, system of it, how the coins are created and things like that, but uh, never got into it. Then, um, like a lot of people in 2016 and 2017, it kind of became more mainstream and had like the kind of parabolic run, you know, up in 2017. Um, it got real hot where everybody was talking about it. So that time period kind of sucked me in to, to do a lot more uh kind of a deep dive about, you know, what Bitcoin's about. And, um, you know, it's kind of a rabbit hole. Uh, once you uh, go down it, you just kind of keep going, you know? So that's kind of the way I found myself when I started reading about it. And I thought, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, get a little bit of it and just kind of get interested in how it works. And the more uh, I read about it and uh, the more I kind of understood how it uh, evolved, how it originated and how it evolved. I just thought the system was really great. In 2018, I just became really big into it. A lot of the people, being kind of a tech head, you know, a lot of people that I know had participated in like the mining process of it, process of it and mined some Bitcoin. And so I was kind of fascinated about how uh, graphics cards and things like that were used to produce it. I was also really fascinated by the fact that 
it's an open source, you know, it's an open source protocol. So every single transaction that takes place on the network is essentially like a huge database. That's really what it is. Mm -hmm. um, an open ledger system. Being a data analyst and uh, just always looking at data, there's this payment system and kind of store a value that you know, it's used globally and across borders and has a limited supply and it's touted as kind of sound money. You know, it's better than our traditional money system. But on top of that, it's just completely transparent. So being somebody who just likes to pour through data and look at it, uh, I started looking at some of the transfers, the on-chain transfers and and how it was sent from place to place, when coins were created. So essentially it's a money system that has timestamps on every creation and transfer of that money. So do you own any of the cryptocurrency? Yeah, I dabble in it a little bit, you know, just being a government worker, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, not like a Wall Street guy in it or anything like that, but I definitely own some of it. And uh, I think that everybody honestly should own some of it is my personal opinion, you know, I'm not financial advice here, but specifically, you know, with some of the things that are going on with COVID, you know, we're having this new kind of monetary expansion, you know, I don't know if you're up on any of that kind of stuff or not. I am not. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's not, uh, it's not exactly stuff that gets talked about in parties a lot. You know, you won't hear a lot of people, uh, a lot of the in crowd uh, uh, just sitting around talking about this stuff. But, you know, the government's creating, of course, a lot of money to pay for stimulus and COVID mm -hmm. relief we've actually printed quite a bit of money, you know, in the past like couple of years. Oh yeah, sure. And, and to some degree, you know, I have kids, I have two kids that are, you know, most important thing to me in my life. Uh, I just kind of worry a little bit about what that picture is going to look like while we keep uh, just printing money, you know, for the United States. But so I, I do find it fascinating because uh -huh. the, the whole idea is we as a society can create value for anything, right? Yeah. If we just decide that, you know, a blue toothbrush is valuable, then a blue toothbrush is going to be valuable. And That's right. I, I think it's fascinating when just as I am watching this is really from far, far away, because I do not know much about cryptocurrency, but it is fascinating that if we are all going to start coming onto this system and able to trade and use this currency, then it'll gain value. It seems like it's gone up, it's gone down. And I've seen some of the big headlines that I find interesting. There was a NFL football player, I think it was from Carolina, yeah, that decided to get paid by Bitcoin. By the time the football season ended, he was in like the top 40 most well-paid NFL football players, and he was a, a lineman. I mean, it wasn't anything. He was just easily the highest paid lineman in in the NFL, and because yeah, that value that value was so had had gained so much in the period throughout the season. Yeah, I remember that story for sure. Yeah, there were um, there were some people that did that. Yeah, there's all kinds of stories about people who threw away an old laptop laptop from you know seven years ago or something like that, and now they're having. Uh, they're, they're asking a city to dig up a dump just to go find it, you know, because it's become so, so valuable um, oh, with those Bitcoins right. locked. <laughs> you know, I don't have to worry about any of that stuff. I wasn't. So, yeah, that I guess maybe, maybe explain that a little bit to me, because that's probably one thing I don't understand, because I have heard where there was been some folks that either the, I think they were left it in a, as part of a settlement or that basically the person that originally owned it died and now they have literally no way to access the Bitcoin. Yeah. So each transaction, the information is stored with a private key on your, you can store it on your computer or you can store it now on a cloud. There's exchanges that will hold it for you. But when you, you have it on an exchange, they hold your private key. When you have it and they call it cold storage. Um, it will be a wallet that you would hold in your possession. You know, they, they sell USB keys now that are really popular that are specifically dedicated with software to hold the private keys of the Bitcoin, the amount of Bitcoin that you have, right? So it's got an air gap between a network. So you have this information on a 
say thumb drive that's in your possession well the only way to verify that you have it is by connecting to the network by plugging it in connecting to the internet and being able to transfer that with your private key so I don't know if that makes sense or not to you. Yeah, if I'm yeah, it does. So, so, so essentially, you just have this on your. Essentially, you just have this on your thumb drive, and it's a it's a string of hexadecimal characters and code. The the representation of how much of that you have. So, given your personal interest of cryptocurrency, have you found interesting connections between cryptocurrency and law enforcement analysis? Yeah, that's kind of one of the things that kept me really fascinated with it. And I, I, I think it's something that all analysts should probably take a look at as far as tools in the toolbox. But like I said, because it's an open source system, all the transfers and transactions that take place are searchable. It's a large database on this open source ledger, right? So, you know, initially it, thought, it was thought of that Bitcoin's being used for all this criminal transactions. Um, so there's training, we've taken some training and a lot of the federal agencies will offer it and kind of blockchain analysis and transfer analysis and, and tracking the uh, chain and, and back kind of back tracing these transactions. So if you, if you think about it from the law enforcement perspective, um, if somebody, you know, we do a lot of link charts and if you go to training and, and link charting I2 or something like that, you might do some some telephone toll analysis in I2 where you know, you're saying person A called person B and person B then called C and then they got on a freeway call with D and F and then C came back in and then, you know, um, you may be asked to uh, visually represent that information, right? Um, and you'd have to have a warrant or subpoena to get all those cell phone records together and visualize that. Uh, but with Bitcoin, it's actually just freely available. All that information about value transfers from wallet to wallet. It was kind of in the news recently with um, the Colonial Pipeline getting hacked. And they shut down the transfer of oil or gas for a time period. And as, as a demand, they asked for ransom in Bitcoin. And the company paid them, Colonial, I think, paid them. And then the FBI was on the case. And they were able to track down those payments. And I've seen some pretty neat link charts that on that specific topic that kind of show those payments bouncing from wallet to wallet and you know, kind of how the criminals might want to slice up the payment and send it to a different place and then bring it back together. So it, it does have, I don't know, on that side of it, it's kind of uh it's I think it's really pretty applicable to the analyst field and how you might be able to get some ideas from what other analysts do. So I always find that you know, when it's high, something really important, like high dollar criminal investigations by the FBI, you see some of the best products, you know, some of the best visualizations and uh, you can kind of get some ideas about how you might want to integrate that stuff into some of the telephone toll stuff that you do. Very good. All right. Well, let's move on. And I want to get to play a little, don't be that analyst. I got some callers on the line here. For those that may be new to the show, this is a call-in segment in which uh, folks call in and let us know what not to do as a law enforcement analyst. All right? Sounds good. First on the line is Brian. Brian, what is your don't be that analyst? Don't be the analyst who believes that typing in all caps is easier to read. <laughs> That's kind of an old one, you know, typing in all caps. I had a officer that I worked with in Cincinnati, Paul Byers. He always liked to type in all caps. To me, that's always been something about yelling. And But he found it easier to read. And so I don't know how many people these days are typing in all caps without meaning it as they're yelling. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I think people take it that way a lot. We had a we had a commander that did the same thing. Um, and he was really he was on Facebook and he put a lot of stuff out to the community. And they ended up a lot of the comments would be like, "Settle down, uh, Commander Caps Lock," you know, and because uh, they just kind of took it as him uh, yelling in his post. So it was pretty funny. That that, that kind of goes back to cryptocurrency, though. When I think about it, because again, if we're all going to agree that when you write in all caps, it means you're yelling, then that, we are coming together as a society to establish that standard. I, I'm surprised how many people have just accepted that as the rule. Yeah. Next on the line is Nate. Nate, what's your don't be that analyst? 
Don't be that analyst who attempts to answer a question to which you don't know the answer. Just say you don't have the answer to that now, but you will get back to them. And then please get back to them. That's, this is an interesting one because actually I was asked this once in an interview. I really think maybe I messed it up. I didn't get the job. <laughs> so that was probably <laughs> one of the reasons. But they asked me what would happen if I didn't know something. And I remember saying, well, if I didn't know it, I would just say, I don't know. I went into the more of the angle of, I wouldn't pretend that I know something that I don't. Right. right. And I didn't ask the thing. And I was like, oh, but then I would go hurry up and figure out what it was. And I would kind of close that loop. And I remember in hindsight that I didn't say that. I think that's what the interviewers were looking for. Yeah, I, I kind of agree with the caller. I mean, that would be my uh, initial mentality on that. You know, just tell somebody, hey, you know, if, they, if they've worked with you for, for a while, they know, you know, you are going to get back to them on that, you know. So I think it goes over well. Maybe it, maybe it has a little bit to do with who your audience is in that situation. You know, if it's somebody you, you hardly know, you know. Good. All right. Next on the line is Lauren. Lauren, what is your don't be that analyst? Don't be that analyst. Just remember, you know, when you're out and you're representing your your agency, your company, whoever you're working for, um, you know, keep that in the back of your mind. Don't be that analyst that everyone's talking about when you get back from the conference. You, you don't want to be that person. <laughs> That's interesting because wow. I, I always think about <laughs> Christmas office parties like in the 80s. <laughs> like, kind of, uh, right? Yeah. Absolutely. You don't want to be talked about for the wrong reasons. Right. Yeah, I don't know. There's two sides to that. You know, everybody likes to have a good time. But yeah, it's probably not going to be me that's uh, running around with the lampshade on my head or anything <laughs> like that, you know. so. But still good advice. It's good, good advice, advice, for sure. Advice. Yeah. yeah. All right. Then next on the line is Kristen. Kristen, what is your don't be that analyst? Don't be that analyst that assumes that your audience automatically knows and understands the specifics about whatever you're talking about. And this is, can be a tough one, even for an experienced presenter. Where do you start your presentation? What do you assume your audience knows? And how far down the rabbit hole, how detailed do you go? Where do you start sometimes with your presentation because i think with any presentation no matter how basic it is there are some assumptions made that of what the audience is going to understand yeah that's a tough one for analysts because most most analysts i know are really detail oriented i kind of consider myself that way you know we get a little bit meticulous and maybe even neurotic about like how how in depth we explain everything and you know some people can kind of you can just kind of see their eyes glaze over you know and uh and you just kind of say in the a lot of detail that they that they might not need but at the same time you know um i agree with the the caller and i kind of think about that when i when people are using acronyms in law enforcement or in yes. technology you know for that matter you know when we're using uh, a lot of those federal agencies or, you know, even even meetings and, and things like that where we have an acronym for it and we're talking to somebody else that works with us but isn't in our daily job, you know, they're, a lot of times you just have no clue what you're talking about. All right. Aaron, what is your don't be that analyst? My don't be that analyst is don't use the word tasked. Uh, it comes off as though you are completely uninterested and disengaged with your work. And it, I feel like it's the written equivalent of like an eye roll and a shrug. And so I just ask analysts, don't use the word tasks, Re reframe that and be invested in what you've been asked to do. I think that's interesting. And I didn't give it much thought. I do use the word task since it was part of my task, or I do use that a lot. And I never thought about it being reflective as something I didn't want to do. It was just something that I was asked to do. That's what I was doing, right? I never, I never thought about it having such a negative connotation. Yeah, I kind of with you there. I wouldn't really, if I use it, I, I don't even know if I do, but I probably do. And I wouldn't think of any, anything of it, you know, if I heard you say it, but you know, to somebody, I guess, you know, maybe it comes off that way. What's her, what was the substitute word? You know, what are we supposed to substitute with on that? 
I think it was just asked, or this is just something that I'm doing, right? This thing, uh, oh, I was tasked to do it. it. I think what she's referring to, it's almost that, like the attitude that you, how you say it, right? It's when, to me, it reminds me of when someone says, well, I'm being made to do this. Yeah. Or he or she made me do this. Yeah. And it's, okay. I think what she's getting at is, you, you know, when you say it's task, it's almost as if it's something that I don't really want to do, but I'm being forced to do it, or it's a requirement that I'm not really happy to do. I, I think you. that's where she's going with this, yeah. which is which is a valid point and great advice, actually. Just yeah. be be conscientious of how you're using certain words. Yeah, give it that can do attitude. Yeah. yeah. All right. And one more. Steve, what's your don't be that analyst? Don't be that analyst that gets carried away with color coding, please. I have I get spreadsheets from every, people from all over the US and everybody's got their own system for color coding and sometimes I'll have spreadsheets that have you know 20 or 30 different colors on them sometimes it just you can't work with that yeah that's a tough one especially when you're dealing with mapping right and when you want to show seven eight different types of data on a map it gets tough to give each one of them a distinct color yeah i think it's something to consider for sure being a guy i think that my color uh, coordination isn't quite as good as some other analysts you know uh, <laughs> so it's just it's kind of like interior design you know some people can walk into a room and you know tie the couch and, and and the paint and the walls and the vanity and all those kind of things together but you know some people it comes naturally too but i kind of try to look at it what some of those people i've noticed like are good with color schemes have done and just you know get my ideas from them because that's not that's not always something that just pops right in my head and very good all right so our last segment to the show is words to the world and this is where i give the guests the last word todd you can promote any idea that you wish but what are your words to the world i try not to uh ever forget how i felt when i first got the job you know um, most analysts i know have a passion for this and data analysis and law enforcement and a lot of analysts that I know when they first started out, they practically do the job for free. And I was the same way when I first started out. And I always try to, you know, sometimes it gets a little monotonous doing the same thing in the police department. And I always just try to remember, um, you know, just kind of what was going through my head and my thought process during that time period and just how excited I was to really get the opportunity to do this job. I think it's obviously a great field. I definitely like to thank you, Jason, for doing this podcast. I think it's really fascinating to hear what other analysts have to say, what they're working on, the, the bad stories and new things that they're interested in. I would also encourage people to learn something new and bring it to your organization. The analyst profession seems to keep going. Technology just seems to keep getting uh, more and more advanced. So many things are automated and there's software to do everything. And uh, I think some people I know can kind of, I mean, myself included, can kind of get to the point where you just kind of feel like there's something to, there, there's a computer related dashboard or something like that to do a lot of these things that we used to do as analysts. And, you know, the way I approach that and kind of try to bring something new to the table is try to learn something new. Um, there's the entire data sciences fields a field that's kind of growing, I feel like, and it's it's kind of on the cusp, a lot of uh, cutting edge stuff that people are doing in other industries, uh, whether it's like finance or, or you know, the healthcare industry, um, talking about a lot of uh, artificial intelligence type applications that just consume a ton of data, make decisions from that information. I think our government system, the federal government, you know, like we've seen from COVID, they're using data to make decisions um, on everything. And the analysis that's being done in all those fields is, is pivotal to that decision making process. Um, you know, how we're spending money, the future that we're shaping and things like that. And uh, I just encourage everybody to keep an eye on all that, all those other fields and, and how they're using data and, you know, bring it to law enforcement and use it to uh, create a better product, you know, that helps the community out and is, uh, enhances the public safety. Very good. Well, I leave every guest with you. have given me just enough to talk bad about you later. <laughs> but I do appreciate you being on the show, Todd. Thank you so much, and you be safe. All right. Thanks for having me. 
Thank you for joining us today on Analyst Talk with Jason Alder. We hope you not only enjoyed the show, but also learned something new. For more information on our guests and information relating to today's topic, please visit our website at leapodcast.com. Special thanks to the Rough and Tumble for our theme song. For more of their music, you can visit their website at theroughandtumble.com. Also, thanks to Kyle McMullen for our show logo. For more of his design, please visit his website at moderntype.com. The show is hosted, recorded, and edited by Jason Elder and written by me, Mindy. You can contact us both via the LEA podcast website. Please join us again next time as we interview another expert in this great field.